Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, introducers for time immemorial have said the next speaker needs no introduction. The next speaker needs no introduction. Tanya Longa will speak to us about attacking elliptic curve challenges. Well, thank you very much. Uh, also, thanks to all of you for sticking around in spite of no rains or whatever outside. So very pleased to see you here. The beginning of my talk has already been taken care of kind of by Scott Vanstone, who was in his acceptance speech for the plaque, mentioning that they had um, put out some challenges. So in 1997, Certicom had tr started marketing elliptic curve cryptography and were trying to get the community to help build confidence in elliptic curves. I mean, that's, that's the normal thing. If you propose a new crypto system, people are skeptical. They don't really see advantage of the new system over the old one. And maybe, maybe there are disadvantages. I mean, there's been more research on RSA at that point than there was on breaking elliptic curve cryptography. And hence came the challenges, and Scott already mentioned that some of those were exercises, and he mentioned a little bit of uh, uh, questioning how hard the exercises would be, that he thought they were easier, uh, that he thought they were hard, and Alfred thought they were easier. Anyway, the exercises were solved, and the background, well, building confidence in elliptic curves, it's very nice to see the Elliptic Curve Conference being now in its 14th year, us celebrating 25 years of elliptic curves and everything, including elliptic curve cryptography. So apparently there's enough confidence or interest in the community. So the, the marketing of Certicom certainly worked out. So here is the easy challenges. So 79-bit, that's the group size. So if you use your general code of the group order, estimates, then this is the computation of 2 to the 40, which now is very conveniently done on the laptop. And even thinking back at what computers were like in 97, that's not a hard computation. So they were estimating 146 machine days, and they were willing to give away the handbook of, of uh, applied cryptography, <laughs> which I guess they had a few in the shelves. <laughs> Similar lab prizes uh, were for the next challenges. So. Um, to introduce the names, so the P up here means it's a curve over a prime field. The 2 means it's over a binary field, but the curve is defined over the extension field. And K, which appears down here, stands for a Koblitz curve. So that's a curve defined over the F2 and then considered above a small field. Most of the time, the number here indicates that this is a 2 to the 89, F2 to the 89 or F2 to the 79, or here it's a 79-bit prime. There's some deviations from that on the next page. So these were the, the easy ones, and they are all done. So different levels of how easy it was, but yeah, they're done. Then the next ones are more serious challenges. You see suddenly there's real money, like 10,000. And sometimes the naming is a bit hard to understand. So for instance, 109 does not mean it's 2 to the 109 is a field, it's still 2 to the 100 and, uh, sorry, 108. Um, it's still a field of 2 to the 109, but because it's of Corbett's curve, you lose a bit. So apparently that gave it an um, 2K108. And the, the statement coming with this was saying, the 109-bit level one challenges are feasible using a very large network of computers. The 131-bit level one challenges are expected to be feas infeasible against realistic software and hardware attacks, unless, of course, a new algorithm for the ECDLP is discovered. And then they were going on with challenges at the level where they actually were thinking about. So in Yun Fen's talk, he was saying, well, Tanya is leading a team to break the, the ECC 2K130, so I guess you, your boss will not be comfortable with this. Uh, and your boss will ask you, why would you be going for, for overkill if you can be just comfortably fine here? Comfortably fine in Certicom money just means 30,000. <laughs> so at prices that we have right now, I'm very <laughs> sure you cannot buy hardware for 30,000 that will break this, which means it's secure. <laughs> well, 
seriously, we did some estimates of how hard it would be to break those, and it's certainly not within that budget. Then for the other ones, it gets uh, harder. The estimates go up to uh, quite a long time to break it, and the prize money would be quite noticeable. Now, the history of this already mentioned all the exercises were broken quickly. So in particular, Harley was, Rob Harley was very visible in doing that. So he must now have a few copies of the Handbook of, of Applied Cryptography on his shelf. <laughs> but then he also went for the more serious challenges to get a bit of money. And it says Harley et al. So he usually had a team of people around him, led by him, or well, the first one led by him and Bailey. And then apparently in 2000, he lost interest in this. And Chris Monaco was starting to do the remaining somewhat doable challenges. So as of 2004, all the 109-bit level challenges are done, are solved. And since then, not much has happened. And when we looked at this, the last update to the document from Certicom was in 2003. And they still said that all the 131-bit challenges are infeasible. So there was at a point when these challenges had been solved or were about to be solved. OK, and so we had a good time. We had an ECRIP meeting in Lausanne, and we were hanging around with a bunch of people doing, um, well, in ECRIP we do research retreats. So we meet with people who have similar interests, and then we say, hmm, with our knowledge, with our abilities around here, what could we do that would be interesting? So we brainstorm a little bit, and it turns out that we have actually around the table quite a few people with expertise and different levels of implementations, going all the way from A6 design, FPGA implementation. So for instance, uh, Yun Fen was around there, and so we had the FPGA um, expertise. Going through, well, here you see a few people that was actually the next meeting, so it's not entirely the same team. But we thought, yeah, with this group of people, we can at least analyze for modern architectures and for well, hardware-like architectures like ASICs, how much does it cost you to build the ASICs to attack those? And so we wrote a biggish paper analyzing the es uh, well, given estimates of how expensive it would be to attack the next target, the ECC 2K130, then the non corporates binary curve, and the other binary curves. We wanted to focus on F2 to the end as a base field just because it's similar in, in arithmetic, so it's also nicer for the hardware implementations. And admittedly, we're kind of tempted by this infeasible. <laughs> Just somebody tells us you can't do this. This is still, well, yeah, a little bit childish, I admit it. But it was this feeling of, yes, you're going to show them. We can do this. Uh, well, the first effect was that the Certicom document now reads uh, maybe within reach. So well, I guess we had success. Um, we managed to update the Certicom document. We're still hoping for the update in the Certicom document where it says broken by the vampire team, but that will come eventually. Um, another outcome of this is that a bunch of people now have a few more papers on their CV, which as an academic is also very nice. So the first paper that we wrote was um, as a direct output of this uh, research retreat appeared at Sharks. Uh, software, uh, sorry, Shark stands for special hardware um, attacks on um, <sighs> cryptographic um, <coughs> then systems, systems. Okay, good. Um, so the Sharks workshop has been going for a few years. It's something that uh, Christoph Pa and I started initially, and it's a workshop where we look at actual attacks, like how much does it cost you to break blah, where blah is either something which is a downscaled version, like 130 bit or something where we don't see we can build it, but it would be interesting to know how much it costs you to, to break RSA 1024. So that type of papers appears at Sharks, and so our analysis of the elliptic curve challenges was fitting nicely in there. Then after we thought, yeah, maybe within reach, even Certicom now says maybe within reach, good. So the target, and that's what the rest of this talk focuses on, is this particular curve, which is the Corbett's curve, looks like this, so it has um, no x square term here. It's defined over a field of 131 bits. The challenge states the prime group order, so the whole curve has order four times this big prime. 
And then certain Surgicom says, well, we randomly pick the point by randomly picking an x-coordinate, checking that there is a y-coordinate, and then multiplying by the cofactor that gave us the p. We know that p has order l. And then it's the same with getting another random point q. So Surgicom says, we don't know what the result of the challenge is. So we cannot solve the challenge by breaking into Surgicom headquarters. They don't know either. So our challenge now is find the case so that q equals k times p. So we thought this was a worthy target, not only because of the um, 20,000 Canadian dollars, but actually for scientific reasons. There are people who do propose using very small finite fields for applications such as, well, RFID. You saw how tempting it would be to save a little bit more area and go down. So there's a proposal for tiny Tate. This is a pairings application and in general RFID. You might say, okay, if it's just on a box of milk, then the lifetime of this chip is so short that we don't worry about an academic attacker who still takes more than a year to break it. But still, they should at least know how weak or how strong it is. Now, going into the details of what this means, um, to attack this thing, we first should understand how it is used in a crypto system. So this is the binary curve, so the addition on this Weierstrass curve, so we didn't move it to Edwards form. Edwards forms are very nice for uh, implementations for the attack. We stuck with the Weierstrass form here. Um, if you add two points that have nothing special with each other to do, then the sum is given with the usual slope formula. And if you have a doubling, then it looks like this. So each of these operations, whether it's an addition or doubling, costs you one version, two multiplications, and one square. <coughs> if you wanted to use this curve for cryptography, so for constructive applications, you would be interested in avoiding the inversion, going for projective formulas, and so on. And um, Hussein Hissel already mentioned in his talk that there's an explicit formulas database. So if you're interested in finding out how to constructively work on these curves, go here for other formulas. For attacking those curves, we need to have unique representatives of each point. So we cannot work with a projective representation. At every moment, we want to have one point represented in one way on a the computer. Then the reason why Certicom is putting in binary curves and Corbett's curves separately is that Corbett's curves are very interesting for implementations. They have certain features that make them faster. So what Corbett's observed in 1991, and which is why we now call him Corbett's curves, except for Neil, when he gave his talk, he was talking about uh, ABC curves. Well, it's kind of nice of him, or anomalous binary curves. Um, he observed that we have an extra structure on this. Usually, if I give you a point and tell you, find me another point, you go and double the point, triple the point, quadruple the point. This is your ways of jumping around. And then you can add those, but you'll always stay in the cyclic group and just move by computing multiples of the point. On a Corbett's curve, there is a further operation. Namely, if you have a point x, y, which is defined over the big field, then because these, all the coefficients of a is in 0 and 1, so it's over the f2, over the subfield, if, uh, if you do the math and put a q on both sides here, computers to the power of q, then nothing happens to the coefficients because they live over the base field. And suddenly, you have that your point to the power of 2 is also in the field. So here we have another way of jumping around on the curve. You gave me an xy, and then the next point is x square y square. That's also on the mm -hmm. curve. Of course, if you're in a prime order group, this will be some multiple of your point. So it's nothing that really gets you out of your system. It will be, again, some kth multiple. But k is a big number, usually. It's not like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And even though it's a big number, this is a very cheap computation. And then to use this cheap computation, um, well, Corbett in his initial proposal said it would be good to use this for scalar multiplication. And he had some good idea there. His own version wasn't particularly fast, but then Mayan Staffelbach came along and shortened it. And then Jerry Salinas had the very nice idea of um, coming up with sparse representations that are short. 
they have the same bit length as a usual binary representation, but instead of doing uh, log m for m your scalar, that many doublings, you replace each doubling by one of those sigmas. And sigma is just two squarings. That's a whole lot cheaper. Now, I didn't mention what this was. Um, sigma is called the Frobenius endomorphism of the curve. Do you know the Frobenius automorphism of a field? If you're in F p to the n, then this computes the pth power of your element. And this just extends to the curve, and therefore it's also called the Frobenius. So addition still stays the same, but you can always reduce the number of additions by going for sparse presentations. Oh, sorry. So that's why people are interested in using Kolbitz curves, because they're cheaper when you use them in, in scalar multiplication. They make your protocols run faster. And quite a lot faster because, well, I just made the big expensive doublings be very cheap. Usually you have to pay a price, and there is some drawback in the, the security of those. And then once you know how much that is, you can balance those. So Certicom says, well, let's just put prime fields, general binary fields, and Koblitz curve as the examples here. And then people can attack all of those and can write designated attacks. The general attacks against the discrete logarithm problem, so you want to find this k which links the p and the q, the points that you're given. Um, the best we know is square root type of attacks. We do not know anything like index calculus. So Neil was referring to his talk on the golden shield, which he thought was maybe a bit <sighs> too flowery, too much. Uh, uh, the golden shield was maybe too, uh, too much pathos. But it is still, we don't know how to get any lifting algorithm done. So here we are with the best known attacks running about the scroll of the group order. So in our case, the group order, <coughs> it was a curve over 131 bit field. We have a cofactor of four. So the group order has 129 bits. So take the square root of that, so you're down to 64.5 bits. That many to the 65 operations, where operations still need to be defined. To get there, well, I was skipping over this factor of 4 because, well, we're working in a prime group. And yes, Certicom is fully aware that there is something called the Poldi Helmer attack, which breaks down any big discrete logarithm problem into a small discrete logarithm problem in the subgroups. So yes, we focus on prime order groups. Then baby step, giant step is the easiest if you want to explain it to somebody. You make one big table with jumping around in big steps. And you make a, then you check by jumping around in a small table. And at every moment, you check whether you match. And you set up these tables so that there must be a match. Drawback is, well, you have to store a table of square with the group order size. Pollock's row method has the same up to constants expected running time, but avoids the storage. So what Pollard's row does is it grabs an element, grabs another element, and checks whether they're the same. And you know when you have a bag with L balls, then the Bursty paradox then tells you that after about square root of L, you'll get the same one twice. So that's why there is always the square root of L appearing in the in the attack estimates. There is something like multiple target attacks. For instance, you want to attack the best curve, and you know that many people are working on it. Yes, you can kind of um, average your costs, but Certicom just gave us a single challenge. So we do not have to worry about uh, multiple target attacks. It doesn't work here. Then what does Paul's row method do? Um, this drawing from the urn, it actually does a walk. So if you want to have any knowledge of what it means to draw the same ball twice, you want to relate this to the discrete log problem. And so they say, we make a walk for every moment we know where we are in terms of multiples of p and q. And if we jump around and we hit the same point again, then we have two expressions of the scalars how we got there. So for this jumping around, there is a function which is called the iteration function f here which jumps from one point pi to another point pi plus 1. And then it's up to us to find a way to make this function look random so that we can use the Bursley paradox and to assume that it's, well, with the usual estimates, it's the of the group order. 
Here's one way of doing this. Assume I know how I got here. I'm at pi, and I know I have ai copies of p, and I have bi copies of q. And then there's a way of getting from this pi. Whenever I hit this pi, I'll do the same step. I go here. And I know how many additional copies of q and of p got me here. And then I move like a, a, uh, like a figure on a board game. At every moment, I go somewhere and I look what's on this field. It tells me I'll go that way, go that way, go this way. And on the side, I keep my counters of how many p's and how many q's I have. And then after I walk around the whole thing, I come back here. Now I'm here at pj. So I have my scalars aj and bj. But I'm at the same point. Now assuming that my walk was through the whole thing, it's fairly unlikely that bi and bj are the same. I would have added something. Well, there is still the group order. There might be the same module, the group order, but usually they are not. So I have this, this expression there. And if they are not the same module, the group order, I can divide by bi minus bj. And suddenly, I know the relation between p and q. Now, for a while, I'm going to talk to you about how I make this board game, how I lay out the pull a card, and now you go this way, now you go this way. If you do this, then this is called an adding walk, because at every point, you add something to it. So this point here will tell me, go forward by one, go left by three, meaning add p, one copy of p, and add three copies of q. That's the easiest way to, to make such a board game plan. And it should somehow depend on the spot where I am. If I don't want to draw the whole board game, and I don't want to draw the whole board game because it's going to have two to the 130 little spots to stand on. So I have to get something, some property of the spot where I'm standing. So I take the representation of this point, take a hash function, and use the output of this hash function to get my new instruction. So this point will have some binary representation. I take this binary representation, run it through a hash function. The hash function then says, ah, this output, this short output, now tells me one forward, three to the left. But also, this point over there might tell me the same. So I will reuse instructions. But still, if I have enough different instructions, this will look rather relatively random. So here's an example of what it does look like when I print out the whole board game plan. So every little dot here is a spot you could stand. And then, well, there is some drawing. It gets you this way, this way. So assume you're standing here. You go up, 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 up. And here, well, then I have to get closer to see how it, it sends you over here. Now, what happened here is this thing was sending the little figure up, 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 and down then. Didn't go straight here, but took this way in the crossing, and then took this way in the crossing. Now, if the little board game figure comes around again here, it is on the same spot. It has the same binary representation. So it will get the same instruction. Each time the little board figure comes here, it is turned to, told to turn around and go this way. Each time it comes to this crossing, it's turned around here. So it will keep circling forever there. That might be kind of disappointing for the board game figure, but it's actually what I want to have. If I see my little figure circling, and there are ways to figure this out, then I am in a situation where I am here with pi, and I'm again here with pj. That's what we had on the previous slide. That's jackpot. Then I know how I got here. And I know how I got here in two different ways. I know how I got here in the first round, and I know I got here again on the second round. This method is called Pollard's row method, because, well, Pollard suggested it. And if you look at this thing and use a bit of fantasy, it looks like a Greek row. So, Hence the name of the, the, the method. Um, yeah? Looks like you have something that isn't a loop. Maybe. Yeah? The upper left one there. You? Well, OK, there's one thing that you don't see how these things are oriented. 
and honestly, I don't see it either from here. But so you're worried about this clump here? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not sure whether this one would be the loop or this one would be the loop. There are also sometimes straight components like down here. Oh, uh, sorry, there is none. Now this is because it wasn't a, a group. This was just laying out the floor plan. So this is not that we solved the discrete log problem. This was just taking 1,024 elements and giving each of them a random direction. And then you can still observe the same effect. Now, if I want to run this on my computer, then, well, I told you already that we had this e meeting with lots of different experts for different platforms. So if I get somebody who knows ASICs, somebody who knows FPGAs, and then, well, us knowing quite a bit of software, should we then all start the same computation? Should we then all say, OK, well, now all forces on this curve, let's start computing? Well, if we all start our own personal power draw computation on, say, n different computers, then good by probability, you get a square root of n improvement. You are somewhat likely to find this collision sooner. But it's a bad trade off. You do n times the work, you have n computers running but you only get square root of n times the chance. That's where another idea comes in. That's, I mean, what I'm reporting so far is history. That's nothing that we came up with. This is called the parallel row method. And the idea behind this is, instead of having each person find this, this whole row shape, let's get another way of how we notice that we at the same step. Like, I walk a little bit, and whenever I hit one of those power boxes here. Then I phone home and say, oh, I reached a power box here. And by the way, my current position in A's and B's is the following. And then if some other computer, now there's a, another board game figure coming around and hits say, this power box, it phones home and says, I'm standing here. And after a while, from the third or fourth or whatever computer, somebody ends up on this power box, the same that I was before. Phones home. And then home says, oh, huh, I now have two from different computers who have been at this spot. And then we have another collision and can compute things, assuming that we start from different positions. If we start from the same position, then we didn't gain anything. But if we start from different positions, then we have found a collision. So that's the background of the parallel row method. I have n different computers. At each computer, I send off my little board figures on different positions. I remember where they come from. I know where they're going. And they always phone home. Well, we don't call them power boxes anymore. We call them distinguished points. And the way I recognize a distinguished point is that I look at the binary representation and I say, OK, I take those which have the last 15 bits equal to 0, for instance. I need to look at this anyway, because that was the way I decided on my next walk. So I now look at this, A, to decide where to go next, and B, to decide whether I'm on a special point. This, if I do the math, gives me a factor of n speed up. It changes what the picture looks like. I now don't have this huge walk ending up in a row, but I have lots of little walks. For instance, here, this red guy walks a little bit and then finds something which I draw in bigger dots. Those are the distinguished points. So you see lots of short walks. For instance, somebody walking here gets till here. Then sometimes there are a bit longer walks. This guy will go going, going, going until it gets down here. Now up here, we have the collision that we are hoping for. The blue guy was going and hit this black dot. At that point, it reported its position. And the orange one from up here was coming down. And as of here, they're walking on the same path. They get the same instructions because they're on the same spot. And as soon as I hit a distinguished point, they actually inform the home base of this. And at that point, I can stop the computation because I've, yeah? So on average, how many distinguished points do you need? How many distinguished points I need? Well, there is no single answer to this. For instance, if I, so it is my choice what I use for the distinguished point criterion. If I use a very restrictive criterion, like I have 130 bits in my representation, and I want a distinguished point only if 65 bits are 0. That's very rare to happen. So we'll take many, many, many steps to get there. So we'll have long walks and very few distinguished points. 
Alternatively, I can have short walks and many distinguished points. It is still the number of about square root of the group order of iterations of steps that I need to do. So that number doesn't change. But there's a little bit of a trade-off. Each time I hit a distinguished point, we have extra cost for phoning home. So we have networking costs. And so we shouldn't have too many of those. Also, the home base has to store all of this. So to give you an example, um, in the attack that we're currently running, we estimated that we will store 850 terabytes. And we checked, and yes, our cluster is big enough. We can do this. It is nice to have not too long walks because well, at this point, we are done. If we have like lo a long walk going here and not finding anything, this will not help much for the other one. So we'll have some final wasted computations going on. But in the end, we will have, this is the total computation. If I divide by this many uh, iterations, this many distinguished points, then that's a uh, the walk length. So it's, there's a, there's a trade-off. So yeah. How do you actually draw the picture? Hmm? How do you draw this picture? <laughs> I mean, I asked Dan to draw the picture. But what if, if, sorry, every dot is a member of the group. And then every dot, well, this is not really a group. This is just um, assigning to 1,024 elements a direction. So these are the elements, and then the error coming out of them gives you the direction. But that's randomly assigned. And then what did you use? Uh, well, there's, a, there's a package called graph this which brings arrow, it tries to shorten the arrows. So starting from the random graph, that, it tries to shorten the arrows to bring dots close to the dots that they're connected to. So you have a dot for every element, and then, and then you have, what do you mean a direction? There, there are little oh. arrows. It's a bit hard to see from back here. But each dot has a little arrow to the next one. I mean, each element gives you another element. That gives you a connection, and it's directed. And then you lay this out and you use that graph with program to, to com combine those. OK, so far for the general parallelized row method, now comes the point where Corbett's curves are different from other curves or where the curves are different from generic groups. Namely, if you look at p and minus p, then they have the same x coordinate. And those of you who sat through the RUM session on Monday uh, and saw Peter Schwab's uh, enforced presentation have already seen that this uh, can be used as a speed up. If I, instead of saying, oh, I have L points, now consider L over two groups of two points, which I identify by having the same x coordinate, then the probabilities of drawing the same element twice have improved by square root of two, because I have fewer elements in my set. So if I'm able to do double packs of points, which, well, looks very likely because the x coordinate are the same. So it's very easy to identify two points by just looking at the x coordinate instead of looking at x and y. I need to pay a bit of attention so that the walk from p is the same as the walk from minus p. Otherwise, I, I screw up my double packs. So the whole thing has to be organized now on, on double packs of points. The usual way of doing this is, say, we um, define something like an absolute value of the point. We use the x coordinate, and for the out of the two y coordinates, we use one where a certain bit is 0. For instance, on a Corbett's curve, you have y, and you have y plus x. And you know that the x has an even having value. So there's always some way of getting a unique p out of the two. Sometimes it requires a bit of computation. In the case that Peter was presenting in the uh, odd characteristic prime field, it's very easy. You just want the last bit of y to be 0. In the binary case, a little bit more work is necessary. But well, you can say lexicographic minimum, for instance. And then we add to this point the next step. Then what Peter was reporting is it might happen that you run so-called fruitless cycles. So you start at some point pi. You add one of those steps. That gives you pi plus 1. And then pi plus 1 will grab another point. I mean, I do one step, and from here I have a certain possible set of jumps, of steps. And I might take the same. And if in between, by choosing this absolute value, I happen to have negated this, then I've just gotten back. Hmm? 
you're negating me, great, I, fine. So I will keep walking like this for a while, and then backwards and so on. So at this point, the little board game figure is again in a cycle. But this is not a happy cycle. This is an annoying one. It's just one step forward, one step backwards. And I don't learn anything from this. I don't get any knowledge of the discrete log problem. So this is why it's called fruitless. It doesn't give me any knowledge about this discrete log problem. You can also do this with four steps around or six steps around and so on. So the, the two step is the, the easiest to write on the slide, otherwise it gets a bit longer to find all the conditions, but it does happen. So I said before, we can um, detect cycles and we can walk out of them and Peter's, uh, the, the whole point of Peter's talk was to say, yes, we know how to handle those guys. At the same time, well, it's nice if you don't have to. The next part is, what else can we do if we have a Corbett's curve? And how is it that Corbett's curves make it easier to avoid such trouble? On the Corbett's curves, we first of all have another thing. I told you that we have this jumping around by squaring both x and y. So instead of saying, oh, we have the same x and then plus minus y, we now have another function which is very easy to compute, just co compute in squares, and we can identify all the points which are in the same cycle under Frobenius. I'm standing here and I'm squaring x and y. I'm squaring x and y, I'm squaring x and y. <coughs> Once I've done this 131 times, and I'm living over f2 to 131, I'm back to where I started. So instead of uh, doing double packs like two points plus and minus p, I can now do packs which contain two endpoints, plus and minus all of those different Frobenius powers. It's reasonably fast to find out in wh who else is in my cycle, so I can find a unique representative. And I've now divided the size of elements to look at by the two from the plus minus and by the n. So the schoolbook speed up that I get for attacking a Corbett's curve as opposed to a random curve is a square root of n speed up where n is the group order. So in this case, n was 131. So we expect that we save about square root of 131, which is why we settled for the Corbett's curve rather than for the general binary curve. The Corbett's curve is about 2 to the 7 easier. Now, how do I get this? Yeah, 2 to the 3.5, not 2 to the 7. Thanks. Yeah, I was thinking 121 is, uh, 128 is 2 to the 7, but square root of that. Thanks. Um, now, how do I build such a function? I could define a canonical representative. I said before, for the plus minus, that's easy. I say, well, least significant bit. In this case, I have to do all the squarings, look at them, store all those endpoints, and say, ah, that one is the smallest. I use that. I can do this. It has been proposed. and. In the world of schoolbook speedups, this is still a speed up of a square root of n. You won't quite see the speed up of a square root of n because it costs a lot of effort to compute all of those points, to solve those points, to compare those points, but it still would work. And yeah, squarings are not so bad in character two. You could do all of that. But mm, there is a nicer one. So Harley observed this in the, well, used it as an implementation at about the same time. Um, Gerhard Lambert and Venstone were writing a paper and pointing it out, namely, if you would do this whole thing in a normal basis representation, so far I've not talked about how I represent this field, but if it was a normal basis representation, then the Hemming weight of x and of x squared and of x to the fourth, in normal basis, all I do is I shift, I do a cyclic shift of the coordinates. It doesn't change the Hemming weight, it doesn't change the number of ones in the representation. So here's an easy measure that grabs all the points. Well, it grabs also more. There's more points of Hemingway 3. But all of those points in the Frobenius cycle will have the same Hemingway. So their suggestion was to use this Hemingway as a way to determine how to go. So what they suggested was we take the Hemingway, well, or do some j which depends on the Hemingway. And then instead of finding a unique point, 
we take the Frobenius of the point and add it to the point. Here's a short calculation to show you that this is compatible with plus and minus. If instead of pi, I put in minus pi, well, it will be minus pi here, it will be minus pi here, which I can pull out of the parentheses. So if I have minus pi, I will also have minus pi plus 1. So I stay in the same class. Similarly, if I have a sigma to the i, this is a j even, well, doesn't quite, some, some i here and some other number there. Um, <coughs> Um, let's call this i prime. So this is not the same as that. If there's some random power of sigma, I can pull it out of here. <coughs> so if I take this as a definition of the walk, it's well defined on classes. Um, Gertler and Vanstone suggest to use the hash of the Hemming weight, and they do the hash in all values between 1 and n. So in our example, any value between 1 and 131. Harley he didn't write it up as a general strategy. He used this in his attack uh, on the ECC2K 108. And he's good at implementation. So he was very, very, he's aware of that it costs you a lot to do a uh, full size 108 or in our case 131 squarings at once. And he reduced it to a small set. You might notice that 3 is missing here. So actually, the way that he computes the J is he takes the Hemming weight. He reduces it mod 7, and then he adds 2, which means that you're in the set 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then he also replaces 3 by 1. So his software is online. You can see that this is exactly the uh, set of steps that he is doing. We looked at this for our thing. Now, first of all, 131 is somewhat bigger than 108. Um, it's much more promising to do this approach than to do an adding walk, where we have to find a unique representative. So yes, very quick decision. This is the right approach. But then we don't want to go with the GLV idea of taking all powers. It's nicer to have a restricted set. And there's many ways in which this is nicer. It is nicer for the implementation if you worry about code size. If you only have to implement 7, as in Harley's, or 8, as will be our suggestion. Uh, different squarings, that's easier than if you have to implement 131 different squarings. Not so much a problem in a general core to core implementation, somewhat a hassle if you're on a cell architecture where the code size actually competes with your registers where you're, or with your memory. So there are reasons, even in software architectures, as you don't want to have so much choice. And then when you talk to Yun Fen and he is laying out what an FPGA would look like, or the RFID then yes, every single different choice costs you area. So you do not want to have 131 different choices, eight choices, maybe 16 if I'm generous today. But you don't want to have that many. And then also in software, what we settled on is an um, approach called bit slicing. And that is something where you com uh, compute many elements at once. So we are actually doing this whole walk on 131, uh, 128 points at the same time. Now, all these 128 points have to somehow follow the same path. There are no branches. Well, I just told you that each point decides on its own. Well, so that means you do the same computation for everybody. So everybody costs as much as the sum of all the computations. And then you pick the right results. You mask somehow that you get the right ones. So it's not that only some would have a huge squaring to do. Everybody would have to do the huge squaring in this implementation setting. There's also a little bit of a worry that we are in this situation where we go one step forward, one step back, one step forwards, one step back, like having a circle, a fruitless one. If I set on a huge set of coefficients, it might be that I find something which adds up to zero, more to the group order. If I have only very few coefficients, then I can actually do the computation to see that it's not going to happen. So what we did when we were designing the iteration function was we settled on having a small set of different powers. We said we want to have two to the, well, eight different choices, say. And then we looked at eight different choices. We want them in an interval consecutively. And we looked if we start 
with squaring once, squaring twice, till squaring eight, um, seven times, it is possible to get uh, such a loop. That's not good. But if we do shifting them by one, no, shifting them by two, then the shortest combination of all of those powers is very large. We just use the lattice uh, algorithm to compute the length of the shortest vector. Now, the shortest vector will have negative coefficients, so it doesn't really tell us exactly what we want to have. But it gives us a lower bound. I mean, if I allow you to use negative coefficients, you have to use these huge ones. Well, if I then say, oh, you're only allowed to use positive ones, it can only be larger. So that's what we say with, we have a way of avoiding fruitless cycles by doing this. So instead of avoiding them in the sense of taking care of them, what Peter was reporting for the odd characteristic, we just don't run into those by this choice of the iteration function. And then, yeah, I said interval, it's better. That's just an implementation issue that if I have to do all of them, well, if I have the square and I have the fourth power, then it's convenient to continue like this. So our definition of the iteration function is we take the Hemming weight. Um, technicality on the side, we notice it's always even. And if you just want to have eight numbers and we compute mod eight, then we would only get four different values. Well, so we divide the Hemming weight by two and then compute mod eight. And then to avoid such short combinations, we shift the interval by three. So here is the J's that we use for computing uh, j's powers of Frobenius in the steps. So what it costs us is to compute the Hemming weight, to do the normal basis representation. Actually, it will turn out we actually compute a normal basis representation, so it doesn't cost much. Then we check for distinguished points, where our criterion was that the Hemming weight is less than or equal to 34. So that is the number which gives us the 850 terabyte of storage. If we would have been a bit more generous, collected more points, it would have overflown the capacity of my cluster. If we would have been less generous, so more restrictive on, on finding those points, then we would end up having very long runs on the machines. And that is sometimes wasteful. Well, and then for the computation, we have to find out j, and we have to compute sigma to the j's power, so 2 to the j of x and to the j of y, and add the points. Then we sat down and analyzed what it means to have this iteration function. I started by saying, oh, we're pulling out of our bag with L elements, totally randomly. And then I was talking about this board game, which still had fairly random layout. And I said, OK, well, if we now restrict things, we have to make sure that this assignment of steps is still sufficiently random. Because you can only hope for the birthday attack, a birthday bound, the square root of L, if you have a random walk or if a random way of, of taking elements out of your bag. I mean, I could be doing a very non-random walk just in a circle, and it wouldn't tell me anything. So we have to analyze how close our walk is to a random walk. So how much we can hope that we get this square of the group order. Now, our group order I mentioned before is about cofactor of 4. Get that away. Then we hope to get a speed up from using the negation, the double packs of points and from the Frobenius, so having 131 times two points regarded as one element. Um, we do lose a bit of randomness by restricting to only eight choices for the J. So in some sense, the GLV approach of taking a hash function on this gives you more randomness. But we're talking about a percent here. Reason for this, well, if you, if you draw, like, there's many, many elements who have about as many zeros or ones. So having weight 66, 65 is very, very frequent. Having weight 0, OK, in this case, doesn't happen at all. OK, having weight 2 happens very rarely. 4 happens a little more frequently. So you draw this, and you get this huge bump in the middle. There's many, many more elements having an average having weight of, well, no, having having weight around the average than having on the extremes. And also, when you compute mod 8, you still see this distribution. Sure, we fold in the extreme values, but it still shows. So it's not totally random. But when we analyze this, the heuristics is it's less than 7%. Well, that's what's in the paper right now. We just did something where we looked at, well, like, like second order collisions or anti collisions, every way that we 
do something, we are sure we're not going to have a good collision. So, okay, then we get 7% instead of 6.9993%. You see, it's actually pretty close to 7. So even the more sophisticated analysis doesn't get us much further away from randomness. That means we have the expanded number of iterations as in the textbook version times one point, and then comes the, the probability that we're off. So we'll need about 2 to the 60.9 iterations. And then, well, make the iterations cheap. So the highlights of what we've been doing is we looked at the randomness of the iteration function. We um, went through this by saying, OK, we could have chosen more j's. We could have said, OK, instead of mod 8, we do mod 16 and have 16 choices. But that would make it more expensive to compute a single iteration and would only slightly increase the randomness. Increased randomness means uh, fewer iterations needed. So if we want to have, if you have an eye on the total computation, like the number of iterations needed to break it and the time it takes for each iteration, that was the target where we optimized for. And that's where we ended up choosing eight different selections instead of 16 or, or smaller would be four, but that would be very non-random. <laughs> um, then we have a few more things like we do not actually remember how we got here. Um, the usual textbook version tells you you have to have your little uh, board figure, have a counter of how many AIs and BIs it is collected by now, and keep those and, well, either have a little scorecard. I used so many of these steps, or actually compute the integers. Um, we just let our figure run around. We remember where the figure came from. All of the steps are totally deterministic. So the moment that the little figure reaches the power box and phones home, we record where it is. If this power box ever finds a match, we know where those two figures came from. And at that point, it's worth doing the computation again and remembering how we got here. But we don't have to bother the FPGA implementation with remembering how they walked here. So he's actually quite happy that we don't tell him, oh, by the way, uh, aside from computing here on the elliptic curve, we also have to uh, remember a little bit of uh, how many j's of type 1, 2, till 8 we've used, or even worse, how about you implement some arithmetic model to the group order? You remember this nice big prime, it looks beautiful, and then we know exactly which dis discrete log we have for each of the points in our database. But we don't need this. Ideally, we need this for two. Realistically, um, we do not store everything. We do store exactly where this little figure came from, and then we store a hash of the result. Otherwise, it wouldn't fit in the 850 terabyte. By doing a hash of this, we might have a pseudo collision, so to say. We might have two board figures arriving at the same spot, even though it's just the hash values that match. OK, at that point, the server will do some cycles and find out, nope, sorry, it wasn't a match. And we're not telling our clients to shut down at that point. They will continue producing numbers. So there was a bit of a trade-off. So we also have a nice protocol to send those points in. There was this moment where we were thinking, oh, yeah, so what's the bandwidth of Eindhoven University for incoming traffic? And would they actually notice if I use 50% of their traffic? <laughs> yeah, we decided the answer was yes. And then we reduced the amount of traffic that it costs. And we've so far been happily under the radar. We had some issues with. Um, broken power supplies or my university deciding that it's time to do a test and then they shut us down. Um, not so nice because we have, Dan is absolutely right. Dan is holding up a sign saying 850, 850 gigabyte, not terabyte. Thank you, Dan. I apologize. Um, yeah, otherwise we would still not be under the radar for the incoming traffic. So. This highlight gives you some ideas of what's behind there. So we set, our, we set off in teams. So there is now a bunch of different spin-off projects. So I've been pointing at Junfeng a few times because he also is a co-author on this paper. And they have a very nice FPGA implementation, which got published this year at the FPL conference. Um, the same Peter, who was reporting on the <coughs> negation in prime fields, uh, was one of the authors on a paper of doing arithmetic on the cell for this. So we have a bunch of PlayStations 
and as Peter Montgomery mentioned, PlayStations are a very convenient or relatively cheap hardware, and we have been lucky enough to get some uh, bits of the big 200 PlayStation cluster sitting in Lausanne. Then we have um, sat down and done GPUs. So Dan's presentation yesterday ended with saying, oh, actually, number theorists, you should notice that there's a multi-thread world. There's a world where you have lots of tiny little processors all want to do the same. Well, it's a great platform for this attack. We can feed them as many computations as they need. I mean, we, hey, we have a lot to do. We have about two to the 60 computations. We can slice them in chunks of 100 something. We can, ah, if you want 1,000 at the same time, no problem. So this is a great application for highly parallel platforms. Um, little side result was that those platforms don't actually come in an implementation friendly way. <laughs> so if you're a C programmer, then you should be happy with using CUDA, which is what the GPUs want to be programmed in. Um, if you're a good C programmer and are used to writing the speed critical routines in assembly, and you look at where is the assembly for GPUs, and it turns out there is none. OK, so put that project on the side, quickly get a, hey, can't be so hard, design an uh, assembly language for GPUs. Actually, we didn't have to go all the way to designing the assembly language. There was already somebody who has been sitting down with the disassembler to find out what the GPU is doing under certain instructions. Um, that thing was buggy, we fixed it, and we then also wrote a front end in, in, in CASM, so that's dense, uh, human-friendly assembler version, which does part of the register allocation for you. So we had a few side projects coming out of this. Uh, on the math side, we improved how we write down normal bases, and we came up with something we call optimal polynomial bases. So it's a polynomial basis. If you have a type 1 normal basis for your field, you can still speed up polynomial multiplication in that field. If you want to know more, then we have some web pages. There's the ECC challenge at info, which is uh, still anonymous, but you can trust me, it's us. If you want to give me a challenge, like, can you make it that the fifth line says the following? Yes, I can do this. Um, we had submitted the paper for a conference which wanted anonymous submissions, and therefore we don't have the names on there yet. But I think it's uh, about time to put names on there and give credits to everybody. We also have a Twitter page. If you go there, you can see how often my university screws up and uh, how often um, the components break down, like we just had to replace a Western Digital hard drive and got a broken one back. And there's a bunch of papers that came out of this project. Thank you for your attention. Rich? How, far, how far along are you? When will you finish? Well, um, you can go to this page and find out. No, you can go to that page. Um, here is what tallies we have right now. If you look at this, we're like 10% through, which is not so great. Main problem is that we are hoping for the FPGA thing. And that one FPGA cluster um, <coughs> is worth about four to five Lausanne's. Um, Lausanne is capital L, little l is Leuven, E is Eindhoven, D is Dublin, J is Jülich. We actually got some, uh, even got some time on supercomputers, so the graph that we have online is, is pretty bumpy. Um, I have a few more graphs in the presentation that I didn't get around to doing. Um, that one. So here you can see that we actually put in some effort to make things faster, and the biggest uh, improvement we got, oh, they got, is on the FPGAs. So our initial estimates, like October 2009, were 2,000, that we would need 2,000 FPGAs to break this, and now the current estimate is around 600. And, and that, that number of years or something? No, one, uh, that many um, copies of the hardware to run it at that speed, which would break it in a year. Okay. Then, um, one of those Rivieras is 128 FPGAs. So on this scale, that is a seizable fraction. And then we have a few um, applications to supercomputing centers who have lots of idle GPUs, as it turns out, and sometimes actually need to justify their existence. 
<laughs> Nobody can code on them, yeah. Well, we can, so they could just let us run them, and we'll be happy. Further questions? There. If I recall correctly, there was an estimate earlier that you would actually finish um, spring of this, this past spring. Was there an interesting story there? Uh, yeah, that's related to the FPGA story that was scheduled to be ready uh, and running last September. Now, in some sense, the, the, soft, I mean, the, the FPGA implementation wasn't ready at that point either. If you look at where it was at that point, it was definitely worth waiting till March. I mean, March was when Yun Fen visited us, and I think that's when he did a lot of intensive work on this and got this huge speed up. So it was definitely worth waiting till then. But since then, we're sitting down with the code and well, the interesting stories are like, OK, um, they have the FPGA boards, but they don't have the power supply. Because the power supply is somewhere in the US and it's stuck with the ash cloud. That tells you it was around April. Uh, they finally had the FPGA boards and had the power supply and were starting to power the thing on and realized that all but two boards had a little crack because somebody stepped on them. <laughs> then apparently they got the boards fixed or got fresh boards and put them then and this is a small startup company in Kiel and I'm not sure how far they get with their startup if they uh, have a similar attitude each time but um, then it had to come from Kiel down to Bochum and it's now sitting in Bochum and they're now figuring out how to talk to the machine and at the beginning not even the test programs from the company worked on the machine but well Yes. The, the uh, FPGA cluster actually arrived at Bochum uh, seven days ago. So maybe in a couple of weeks we can have it running and uh, you know, start sending uh, these image points to the end of the software. Yeah. But yeah, I think next spring is a more realistic estimate. But also, if you look at the graphs, there was not much happening at the beginning. Victor. So Do you have computers for us? Hmm? Do you have some computer time for us? <laughs> <laughs> I should have asked Rich about this too. No. We're taking that's, donations. That's, that's difficult. Uh, no, I was going to say, so once you uh, find the answer, what next? <laughs> well, we are a government-sponsored project, so we can't actually take the 2000, uh, 20,000. Uh, but we are enough people that if all of us buy airplane ticket to pick up the prize in person <laughs> and have a beer uh, over in Toronto, then the money will be gone. <laughs> and then over that beer, we can discuss whether it's worth it going for the next challenge or not. But I think it's not so much reaching the goal, but the things that we learned on the side. Sure. I mean, you know, so, so have you thought about the, the things that you've learned here and, and nice things? you know, how they might be applied to other things. Yep. So, I mean, some things are very specific to the Cobras curve attack, so they could be used for the 163. And we certainly going to sit down and, and rewrite our estimates, but they won't help much, like, OK, the specific iteration function. But then the analysis of the iteration function is much more accurate than we had before. Also, some of the implementations, like, I mean, the assembly language for GPU we have, and we're certainly going to use for the uh, 131 non corbett curve challenge. And well, maybe it's more interesting to run the prime fields where we have the better negation map now. But if you have any interesting projects, we're <laughs> listening with open ears because, well, once the machines are running, and then we have uh, capacity to think again. Tony. 7% for the penalty for not having a random walk. OK, so the question was about the analysis slide. Um, you mean the 7% compared to the 6.9993, or in general how this happened? In general. <laughs> in general. Um, when you look at, you're standing somewhere and you have a certain out degree. Then um, at every point you, ha and you know what the probability is of going that way. Then you can compute this over the every, um, well, it ends up being like sum over 1 over 1 minus p squared, where p is the probability for each of the steps. And that gives you like the first level 
a deviation from randomness. And then what we have now is um, kind of a second where you have P to the fourth coming in. So there is an appendix over one and a half pages in the paper to, to um, explain that formula. But it's a general formula where you can plug in whatever step function you have. So we had pretty good understandings of like additive walks. Now this is more like a multiplicative walk because we add one plus the sigma, or sigma is like a scalar to the j. And so we have now also that one in there. So it's fairly generic. If you have your random walk or not so random walk, you can plug in the probabilities and get the numbers out. All right, well, <clears throat> I couldn't help noticing that Tanya didn't thank the organizers. So uh, maybe we <laughs> should thank Tanya for the talk and the organization. <laughs>